Welcome everyone. My name is Steve Tulsa. I'm the founder of Wholesale Investor. Just say thank you very much for, for joining the session. This is a new webinar for me, one that I'm super pumped about actually uh, delivering. We are going to be recording this and we're going to be covering some new topics, which, you know, I suppose how this come about was every day for the last, I suppose, 12 months, I've been having conversations with founders about different things related to capital rating. And I try and take things that are super complex and then make them really simple. And so what I've learned when I think about the three challenges that founders mostly have in raising capital, it basically boils down to three areas, right? One is investor access. The second part, and this is the interesting one, is even when people get investor access, the actual real biggest issue really comes to often the, the communication and the process that someone's actually running with their capital raise. And then the third one is actually the, the capital raising strategy. So for this session, I'm going to be talking about really the capital raising process and the communication elements, because I think it was some simple changes and some, and, you know, I suppose the, the highlighting of some very key areas, you can make a radical difference in your, in the way in which you actually position your capital raise. And more than that, I've also included in the second half, I've got things which all the different software tools that I use, right? I'm actually going to be providing how I actually use it as well, because my outcome is always the same. And I communicate this every message is like, how do I keep on providing? How do we keep on building tools which help people save time and really reduce the amount of time you spend raising by up to 80%, right? And just with some simple changes and some simple tools, it is so easy to actually do that. So let's get right into it. Now, as always, I'm happy to chat during the actual session. Just put in the chat and then I'll actually respond to it. These are going to be the topics we're actually going to be going through today. So we're talking about uh, introduction, then the frustrations and challenges that most people have, uh, the capital raising communication and positioning, the investment highlights and building social proof. Then we're talking about how to utilize AI and software in your capital raising strategy. And then I'll be talking about some opportunities to work with us. And I've got some special bonuses uh, as well, which we're really, really pumped about. So heaps to come up in this next hour. I'm going to make it as jam-packed from an information perspective as possible. These are all the questions that people have typically about me. They think that maybe I come from a wealthy family, you know, went to the top of you. All that is inaccurate until even the actual university part is a, is a typo. So no, I didn't go to university. So as I said, for me, everything I've done, I've actually built from scratch and, you know, like everything with WI. But my background was my first love was actually marketing. And then I actually fell in love with innovation and got into corporate advisory and then with that, then I realized all the gaps around corporate advisory, which went on for me to start, you know, wholesale investor. And then obviously we, we in succeeding that now with Capital HQ. So that gives you a bit of a, an in introduction to me. And I think the important thing to know is I've built now a network of 45,000 people across wholesale investor, 25,000 inside Capital HQ. I've got shareholders from nine different countries. And I've got shareholders, which are investment banks, uh, venture capital firms, private high net worth, all ranging from sectors such as private equity, you know, venture capital, legal, accounting, et cetera, you name it. People that have sold businesses successfully. I said, so, you know, just to give you some sort of edifice on, on me. And so that's me on the introduction part. So I'm going to go straight into the workshop, a total of five minutes on my introduction. So... So I, I suppose I'm going to start with this, right? Because these are the common statements that a lot of people are saying to me, right? Is firstly, oh, investors just don't understand us, right? And if you, by the way, if you've experienced any of these, just put a little, just do a little raised hand just so I can actually see, you know, just so I can actually see that you've either experienced or understand what I'm actually talking about. Um, next one, basically, we have lots of great initial conversations with investors, but then they actually, then they ghost us. Next one, great what you're doing and this could be so, you know something that I said to you is really great what you're doing we're interested just come back when you have you know lead investor uh, someone's already got their hand up customers traction x amount of revenue etc right or you feel like you're doing amazing things in the business but you just can't get investors interested and then the last one and this is a favorite one of mine is oh I've raised easily from my own network so why is it so difficult now and these are the common things, common frustrations that companies typically have and common things that, you know, investors will actually say to companies. So, you know, effectively, you know, 
to me, I, I always felt like capital raising is a bit like this. For some reason, people, you know, people take come into this space and the, you know, it's really aligned with the Dunning Kruger effect. Yeah, no, another hand up, brilliant. Uh, in the the less uh, confidence someone has, the more confident they are, right? And effectively, it's only one of those things that the more you actually do it, the more you realize how much you don't actually know. And I would still say that for me, the only difference with me is I literally think about this every day because it's an everyday problem I have to solve for other people and also at times for myself as well, right? So the next one is, I think this is super important, is there's some massive myths about capital raising. And that is, is that first one is that it only takes two to three months to raise money, right? That's a massive mistake. Second one is, is that Fewer than 5% of the companies, and sorry, and just to highlight this, fewer than 5% of companies actually achieve a capital raise end-to-end -end within a two-month period. And I highlight that to people because said people don't really understand it and they think that, you know, it's a different, as I said, there's typically there'll be advisors out there, they'll have investors pressuring them, they'll have everyone trying to make them feel like this should be a, a quick and short-term process. And I remember... When I had my whole perception changed was when I was dealing with a, you know, I was fortunate enough to have an investment banker as a shareholder. And I asked the most honest investment banker I've ever met in my life. And I said, how many times have you and your team been able to complete a capital raise from end to end within a two to three month period? And just watch his eyes just go up and just see things like, never. I was like, okay. And then you go around and you start asking other people and it's also the exact same thing for them as well, right? So effectively, you know, the lot, and this is the next one, and this is the biggest frustration that I have day in, day out, is that effectively a lot of people think that VCs are the only investors in this space. And it's because it's basically they're the ones that are talking the most. Like I just spoke to a group today where we're looking at doing some issues with them and, and they've done the incredible, they've created nearly $700 million worth of value amongst their portfolio company. And I bet no one on this call would know who they are and what they do, right? It's because they don't deal with media, right? Typically, the reason why is this whole ecosystem has been geared up to basically drive potential lead flow to VCs from an opportunity perspective. The reality is, you know, the numbers from a VC perspective look like this. You know, they less they invest in less than one in a hundred companies and sometimes as much as one in a thousand companies. So if that's the case, then who else is funding all these other companies? And for some of you, you've probably done capital raisings before, or you've invested into companies before and you realize there's really high net worth and family offices. And also even the industry participants as well are some of the biggest drivers for investment actually in this space. So, you know, to me, that's an important thing to be aware of is that there is so much more investment opportunity out there. And the reason I articulate this is because lately for the last few months, I've been coming across companies where they get rejected by one VC. They take what that VC rejected them with as gospel and basically it happens all their plans. Now, I don't know if that's a fragile mindset or, you know, the sort of feeling sensitive at the time or whatever it may be. But, you know, just because there's plenty of examples of people getting rejected by hundreds of VCs and still being unicorns. Right. So I just sort of always like to, to highlight this as a starting point that it's not if you can't raise money from VCs, it's not the be all and end all for your business. Right. And also understand they've got a certain profile of opportunity that they're looking to invest into. And you just may be outside of that profile. So the day in the life of us, you know, as business owners, as people that are building companies, this is generally our, our journey, right? We go through a wild emotional swing. The truth is, you know, when you're dealing with capital raising, when an investor says that, yes, I'm going to participate, you know, you feel like you're bulletproof, you feel uplifted, you know, it's, it's a big, you know, there's something it does for your soul, you know, it's someone, you know, is buying and investing in your vision for what you want to build. And when an investor says no to you, you know, or they start go, or they, you know, you have a positive chat and then they start ghosting you, you know, you can often feel like you're this big, right? Because effectively, once again, it's rejection. And the, the best thing I've always said is that if like the, the best way to put capital raising into perspective is that it's like doing online dating, right? Except for the difference with this process is that when you get rejected, People either just start ghosting you or they actually tell you how ugly your baby is. And no one really likes being told how ugly their baby is.
But really, ultimately, capital raising itself, the actual process is just a marketing and sales process. And the difference is, is your business is the actual product. Yes, it's a very personal investment. Yes, it's a very personal, all that sort of stuff. But ultimately, it is, a, it is an opportunity for someone to participate in. But your shares in your company are the product that you're actually offering. And it's a marketing and sales approach, you know, in which you typically go through. So the the other reality is, is, and I know this happens with a lot of, especially the technical founders, a lot of people want to talk about the reality of what activities they do day in and day out, right? But actually what the investor just wants to really understand is what is that vision, right? And I'm talking about in the first call, right? I'm not talking about sort of when you've got a, you know, two, three, five-year relationship with an investor. I'm talking about in that first call, what is it, you know, the investor just wants to understand, like, what is the actual vision you see? I made this mistake for myself where I had an investor where they were looking at putting 500K into my business. This is a few years ago. And we went out for lunch and for an entire hour and a half, I talked passionately about our product and all the things that we were going to do, you know, on the product side to support clients. And by the end of it, he said, I love your enthusiasm for your product. I won't be investing and let me tell you why. And it was literally to this. And this is, and I know this is a mistake that others make, and I, I articulate this because I don't want others to make that same mistake I did. And it's very easy to do because we're super passionate about it. We live it, we breathe it, and we think about it all day long. So the summaries when you're sort of talking about capital raising, and this is, I'll be clear, it's not unique to you. Number one, investor access, right? Everyone talks about this as being their, their number one challenge. And they think that, oh, if I can just access more investors, it will solve all my problems, right? It's not quite accurate. Next one is investors just don't understand, right? Investors don't, you feel like investors don't understand your business, the nature of your industry, or they may not give you the time to, in your eyes, to, to fully explain it, right? And then the last one is, is follow through or feedback, right? Where you sort of have a positive conversation and then from there, you know, you could often be be ghosted, right? These are just the, the challenges summarized. Now, on the first one, I'll just highlight that, you know, accessing investors is part of it. The reality is you probably have a decent amount of people in your network already to engage with your opportunity, right? And it's often what happens is you, everyone sort of wants to keep on finding more, but often there's some that have already been following you for one, two, five years that have basically seen you talk about what you're going to do, do it, and then now they want to support that next stage because they've observed your execution. These investors don't understand part. I actually get pretty aggressive on this with, with founders because, you know, it's not their job. It's not an investor's job to spend additional time trying to understand your business. It is your job to make it as easy to understand your business as humanly possible. And anytime you've got a question where someone doesn't quite understand, it means you need to actually improve the way in which you communicate your opportunity this is probably the one to spend most time on right the third one it is just every day it's a normal tuesday right what day is it today was it wednesday right it's a normal wednesday right it's very much there's not that much that you can do with this part it's the nature of everything you know where there's a relationship between someone who's offering something and someone who's looking to to invest or purchase something right it's it, it's pretty common and my my guidance is typically around the feedback side but the second part that i really help understand with capital raising right because said my the outcome i think is how can we make it less mysterious for people and just think about it from a, a process and a, and a science perspective is capital raising is simply the alignment of thesis right and there's two different theses. I've got my business case thesis, which I put forward, right? This is how I'm going to grow my business. This is the market that I'm operating in. This is what I believe that we can achieve as a company. That's my business case thesis. On the investor side, the investors got their own thesis about your area, right? Because of their networks, their backgrounds, their experiences. And their ideal world is these two different theses align if they align that's effectively when you get the opportunity to have some sort of relationship or some sort of transaction it doesn't mean that it's going to happen straight away but something can happen down the track but these are the two things 
which you're really trying to align with is, as I said, the alignment of thesis of the business case and also the investment thesis as well, right? So then the next question is, is, well, how do you present in a succinct way your business case to engage investors? And said, this is something I've worked so hard on. I remember in 2019, I kid you not, 2019, I spent four months putting together a pitch deck. I was bouncing ideas off anyone and everyone who was happy to have a look at it for me. It ended up such a confused mess. And funny enough, it was one of my team members at the time who basically started helping our clients with their pitch decks. And I remember seeing the front row of an event of ours in uh it was in november it was like november 2019 or something like that and i remember thinking wow all these guys have done better presentations than mine right so then i was as actually then i actually got a team member to actually assist me you know with the actual structuring of that and then that's when i started thinking about how i could actually turn it into a bit of a science so let's go through this so what's really interesting about actually i'm going to go back one so What's really interesting about this pyramid I'm about to show you is that in, in our world, we get told that the pitch deck is absolutely everything, right? And what I've learned now is it is fourth on the rung as far as importance when you're actually going out to new people about your opportunity. And in fact, in the overall scheme of a capital raise, it probably represents less than sort of 5% of importance. So here is this be all and end all document that people think about endlessly that you see in different publications everywhere. Like, like I get feeds all the time. Oh, here's the pitch deck that raised $15 million. Here's the fintech that used this pitch deck to go and raise $5 million for their series A. You know, you get all these headline announcements. It's all just BS, right? So here's what the pyramid really looks like. At the start of everything is your hero text. It's your headline statement about who you are and what you do, right? And I'll give you this, and now, and, and so when I figured this out, it made so much sense because it's basically how us as humans absorb information in all sorts of kind, right? So it starts out with the hero text, and I'm gonna break these down one by one. Then it moves on to typically an introductory paragraph or an introductory statement, right? Then into an elevator pitch. So that's the first, second, and third layer. So it goes the hero text, the statement headline, right, followed by the introductory statement, then an elevator pitch. Third is the investment highlight, and I put slash because I call it capital raising brand elements, right? And then the other one, it's really what it actually is, is social proof, right? And if you actually bring those two together, it makes so much more sense. And then fourth is the pitch deck, right? So Think about that for a second. The document that everyone makes us feel like is the most important thing, it doesn't, it doesn't have the potential to get looked at until the four, the first three have actually been successfully navigated. Right? So what do those first three look like? Now understand the psychology. Think about the history of this. I've put in an old, I've put in an old uh, newspaper, Helen. If you ever, if you learn about marketing and, you know, I was fortunate enough that that's where I sort of got my sort of understanding in this area. And this is why I'm so unique in this space because my background was initially marketing. It all starts with a headline, right? Absolutely everything starts with a headline. Do you know what sort of difference it would make for newspapers, the different headlines that they would have on the front of the newspaper? It was a make or break scenario for the majority. Some people just buy, they would know that there'd be some people that buy the newspaper every single day, no matter what. There'd be other people that was very much, and that's why even the way in which they'd be in stands, you know, it has to be seen and visible so that, that headline could sell copies of that paper. And then of course now, you know, it's more commonly around, you know, online sort of headlines that we get attracted into, or if we're watching YouTube, we get attracted into the headlines that sit inside thumbnails. We are headline-driven key creatures, right? And effectively, you know, what we need to do is we need to understand it is the exact same thing for our business. The sad reality is, is we spend day and night. Here I am at 5.30 almost, you know, I've been up since, what was it, five this morning, 
you know, we work day and night to build our businesses. We love what we do. We're passionate about what we do. You know, we think about it endlessly. And the reality is the person on the other side that's looking at what we do, they give us seconds of headspace. In fact, to give you an idea, it's 200 milliseconds before conscious reasoning, right? So headlines shape initial judgments within 200 milliseconds. So just understand the power of the of the headlines and the hero text. In fact, I had an investor come up and compliment me. I can't remember what event it was. I was at an event recently and they said, wow, the thumbnail said, the, the thumbnails that your clients do now are so much better than what they did previously. And that's because we do training on it, right? Because we know how fickle this entire space is in that we get seconds to get people's attention, right? The next one is our brains are deletion creatures. So we are looking for relevance. So inside that headline, our brain is looking for relevant, trying to match, is this relevant for me, right? And if it's not, I want to delete it from my brain and move on to something that is relevant for me, right? And then the last one is, is can I engage with it? Can I form some sort of vision, right? So if you think about the three layers of what we're trying to, of what someone's trying to understand when they're looking at your headline within seconds, that's the three layers. They're trying to get that fast impression. Then they're trying to understand if it's relevant. And then lastly, they're seeing if it films any sort of vision which resonates with them, right? Next one. So on this, so basically the first step that I recommend to everyone is to create a powerful hero text. What is your three to seven word statement that summarizes what you do. And, you know, looking at some of the, the people on here, I know that some people, you know, do, you know, do advisory work with companies. You can even do it for your own business, right? Effectively, it's all about trying to make sure that within seconds, someone actually understands who you are and what you do, right? So that's the power of creating a powerful hero text. Next, right? And let's see my, this is my one, AI driven capital marketplace. Right. And it used to be, by the way, this also took me months to get to. I was struggling with this for a long time. And then I was very fortunate that one of my shareholders is Kenny Wong. And I was 20 minutes before a presentation. And he said, Steve, it's AI driven capital raising. And I was like, wow. And then I changed it. And then we've only updated it recently. And that's sort of more a reflection of the direction that we're going as a company. Right. But it's really and you're basically seeing that, you know, across the actual business now as far as the direction that we're going. So the elements of it, I'm not going to spend too much. I just realized I'm already sort of almost half an hour in. But effectively, make sure it's concise. Make sure the value proposition is super clear and said relevance to the potential investor that you're looking to in target. And then also see if when you show it to other people, you get engagement in that actual hero text as well. It is worth playing. In fact, this is probably, you know, for me, I would spend more time on this than I'd spend on my pitch deck, right? Because it is it is the most powerful statement that people will see before anything else, right? So I hope I've, I hope I've uh, articulated that really well. Last one is, is memorable. You know, that's always a hard thing to go for. But, you know, if it can be memorable, that's fantastic. Having a vision of scalability right and also allowing someone can actually create a vision my hope is that when you see ai driven private capital marketplace it does create an initial vision for you of what that should actually look like then it's really about when the investor looks at what we're doing is that in alignment and then credibility if you can it does make it a bit long but you can also make this in your next statement as well right so you know some people may have leading you know whatever you know like for me you know, lead, I could maybe try and position leading global private capital marketplace. The actual re only reason why I haven't done that is because I haven't really looked to see who else actually defines himself as a, as, a, as a private capital marketplace. Next one. By the way, is everyone enjoying this so far? I haven't checked in yet. <laughs> this is all new content for me and I'm super passionate about it. But is, is this been helpful so far? Just put it message in the chat if it's been helpful for you, just so I know that uh, I haven't lost everyone to, to start with. Brilliant. Thanks, Rod. All right, thanks, Bill. Appreciate that. Okay, good stuff. Thanks, Andrew. 
Yeah, I said, it, funny enough, this can be used in so many different areas. I said, just people, like, it doesn't matter what it is. Like, I'm using it from a capital raising perspective, but this is really life. <laughs> and we're ever trying to communicate anything, right? Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. All right. Okay, so next one is the introductory statement. So you got to remember, whenever you see any type of article, the first thing they, they know that what gets your attention Remember, it's the old marketing principles, attention, interest, desire, action, right? So the first thing anyone wants to get is attention. And then after someone gets attention, then the next thing is you want interest. So the state, so the statement which comes next is super important for generating the interest. And it's got to address the investor's interest, right? It's got to speak directly to them, right? As far as what is the potential size of this, you know, there may be different things, right? If it's a fund, it's a different way to position it. If it's something innovative, you know, there's different elements to think about. Got to highlight what does that financial opportunity actually look like, right? What are some of the unique selling propositions? Okay, it says use strong verb, use strong sort of active verbs like transforming, empowering. I know that there's another word you could use. The problem is ChatGPT has just overused it and it's revolutionizing. Like I, to the point, like I said, I publicly say how much we actively use you know, AI and software across our business. And, you know, I get angry if I get, you know, any, like I typically do the sort of final look at an email uh, at the sort of weekly email before it goes out. And if I see the word revolutionizing four times, I want to go mad, right? But things like that, but they do make an absolute, they do make a difference. I like words like unique, enabling, you know, empowering, et cetera. And you'll see those words through the copy that we do as a company. It's got to indicate to scalability and growth potential, right? It's got to also have a visionary, once again, that visionary impact also. And again, the memorable component, right? These are all hard to do, but these are the things I remember. Now, this is, now, by the way, I did, before actually doing this session, I realized that I needed to update mine, right? And so I've updated it now. Will this be the final one that I actually go with? I'll probably, Play with it a little bit more, but this is the one where I landed on. So, you know, when you think about private capital marketplace, right, that's got its own little vision. And then this is my headline statement. And I actually come by this from supporting another client of ours, but private capital, and this is all factual numbers, private capital markets will expand to $30 trillion over the next decade. Decade Wholesale investor with over 45,000 subscribers provides a rare three-sided marketplace, which is software-led and utilizes AI ML for matchmaking, right? So, you know, to me, that's my high-level positioning statement, you know, to, that I can actually start with. If you think about the elements of that, it may be a bit wordy and I probably want to try to thing it down, slim it down, but I haven't, you know, I don't know what I want to take out yet, but you get the idea. If someone's looking at us for the first time and they see, AI-driven private capital marketplace, and then they see this as my, it's got all the elements as far as here's how big the market's going to be, here's why we're here's why we're effectively the ones to do it, here's what's unique about us. There's actually two unique elements into it, right? And then this is what's different about how we're actually approaching it, right? So that's the, the now is that clear, Tenant? Does anyone have any questions about the, the sort of qualifying statement? By the way, this would probably be more fun to do actually in a live session where I'm getting people to talk about their own and, you know, sort of making it a bit more active and engaging where people could actually do their own for their own business, you know, and sort of repeat it back to everyone. All right, the elevator pitch, right? This is commonly talked about and I still don't think a lot of people are actually good at doing it. And I had a transformational moment with a client one time. The company is called, it was called Essential Queensland. And I remember speaking with Ray well, at our mergers event and he was just so frustrated. He goes, investors don't, your investors, it's, actually, it's always when people say it to me, it's always your investors don't understand what we do. It's like I own their minds. It's like, and so my belief, whenever I hear that, I straight away, my job is I just sit there thinking it's your job to help them understand simply, not, you know, they investors shouldn't have to work hard to understand what someone does it's our job to make it simple so i come up with a simple oh, sorry i didn't i didn't come up with it there's a simple framework for an elevator pitch and i've seen lots of people talk about it and here is the framework that i think makes most sense for talking about an elevator pitch it is simply do you know how you identify the problem right and then the second line is what we do is 
right? So in my case, it could be, do you know how, you know, startups or scale-ups find it frustrating to access investors and raise capital, as an example, right? But just think about it for your own business. Like this has got to be really simple. It's got to be really brief. That example with Ray, to give you an idea, when he was saying, you know, oh, your investors don't understand what we do, blah, blah, blah. I, I turned around and said, so Ray, what do you do? Right? Because I've been working with him for a few months and I didn't actually quite understand. I go, what do you do? 15 minutes later, he was still talking. Right? Now, I'm super polite. So I said, Ray, I was, mate. And by the way, this is all on video. This is not me talking out of school. We did an interview on this. We talked about it. And there's a reason why. And I said, so he, I said, so I've listened to all that. Let me summarize this for you in one line. So I did. I summarized it in for one line. Right. Basically, what he did is he extracts high value oils out of uh, pine trees or and then from there he go, turns it into he turns it into high value products. Right. And, you know, he's after that, he then got acquired. Right. He got acquired by an ASX listed company. Right. And then and no, sorry, he then raised money and then got acquired by an ASX listed company. The funniest thing was, as I said to him, Ray. Do not stop saying this one line statement until you actually sell your business. And he had that done within six months of me teaching in that. It is unbelievable how powerful the right elevator pitch can be for your business, right? And I have to tell you, sometimes when I do this stuff, it's helpful for me as well to remind me because so we all get passionate, we all get enthusiastic, and we can all waffle. So first impressions make a significant impact. I'm not going to spend too much time on these parts, but just... You know, just to reinforce, the elevator pitch is powerful. I said everyone spends our, you know, everyone spends months on pitch decks, right? Pretty much every founder I know has different, probably a hundred to one hundred and fifty different iterations of their pitch deck, right? For me, this is what I think about because I'm not getting to the pitch deck unless I get this right first, right? So just make it efficient, make it ready and professional, and test it on people. Make sure that they understand if they can repeat it back to you or summarize back to you how what you actually do, that's super important. Now, one of my realizations this year was that, actually, when I say this year, it was literally about three weeks ago, that actually investment highlights for what most people deem as investment highlights is actually just social proof. And to summarize the key areas of what social proof looks like, Firstly, notable investors on board, right? So typically, and these are all the elements. So when you actually meet with an investor, so if you've got through the, the hero text, right? If you've got through the headline, you got through the introductory statement, right? You're through the elevator pitch, right? The next step is you've got to make some simple statements which basically qualify that what you're doing is relevant. And so if you think about the attention interest, this is how you create desire, right? The, the, the creation of desire is in social proof. And by the way, I now know I should add the AIDA slide at the start to talk about how this aligns with everything, you know, the attention, interest, desire, action. But the first one is notable investors on board, right? These are people that have looked at you, known you, done due diligence on your business and effectively decided to invest. Customer traction and revenue growth. If you've got blue chip customers, right, then they've effectively done their own sort of form of due diligence on you when you've gone through a procurement process, which could have been anywhere from 12 to 18 months, and they've decided to use your product or service, right? When you're communicating that to an investor, they know that basically you've got some type of traction because this group would have done 12 to 18 months of DD on you, right? And then next one is revenue growth. For the B to C businesses, this is ultra important because it's how you sort of show that you're able to get traction in the product or whatever it is that you're actually, you know, the area that you're going after. If you've received any industry accolades or media mentions, that's also one. It's, you know, one of my, one of our channel partners, Brad Hill, is doing a whole bunch of stuff with doing a TV show called Innovation Nation. Now, out of curiosity, has anyone seen Innovation Nation? Just put a yes if you've seen it, put a no if you've seen it. So he basically, he did perfect. So he's did Innovation Nation and it's, gone, it's been uh, distributed now through Channel 9. Now, what's interesting is the most people that are actually replying to me are saying no. 
the reality is I haven't seen it either in this America. But where did I see Innovation Nation? I saw it on the companies that participated posting on LinkedIn, right? So what's interesting about that is that effectively, sometimes what TV is most helpful for is actually communicating to people in your ecosystem. So even if your target market is not going to be watching it, which I suggest, you know, the most of the people in our ecosystem don't watch too much free to air TV, right? Being able to mention, you know, being able to show your media mentions is important or if you're covered in the AFR or whatever it may be, right? So someone's got pre-seed equals revenue revenue zero. Thanks for that. Um, I was, I don't, I don't even know how to respond to that. Um, blue chip customers or testimonials from high profile users, right? Once again, this is all a game of social proof in the process of raising capital. Your team's expertise and connections. So, for example, if you've got team members, if you notice when now uh, the my one of my favorite people's, if you want to learn how to be an absolute master of communicating what you're doing, follow Yolanda Redrup from the AFR and just watch how she communicates companies. Like she is so good that I've created a prompt to match how she does it, right? That's how good she is at doing it. And she covers off all these different areas really well and really succinctly, right? And she always mentions, oh, that it, when you think about Canva, right? Oh, the ex -can this startup was founded by the ex Canva engineer or this startup was founded by ex Google engineer. Do you know what I mean? Like reverage that, or you know, this startup was founded by XYZ who sold two businesses previously. And then last one is if you've been able to get into exclusive uh, accelerators or programs, then that's also helpful as well. Now, the other one I should mention is board and management. If you have any high profile advisors or board and management uh, as well, that's also super important to that. I'll make sure I add it for the next one. The reason being is that basically, once again, it's all about an investor being able to look at what you're actually doing and go, that's interesting, right? Once again, feeds into that desire component of actually wanting to learn more. All right, now onto everyone's favorite part, the pitch deck. I'm only gonna talk about one area. With the pitch deck, to me, the most important thing, and this is where, and by the way, what I'm showing you right now is just actually helpful for your own business planning right? It's actually helpful for your own thinking, your own business planning, etc. So a key component to your pitch deck, right, is firstly, the use of funds, right? How you're going to be investing the capital, which you're going to be raising from investors, right? And effectively, there's two things you've actually got to connect this with, because these are the two things which actually create value in your opportunity. So number one is your growth drivers. And number two, if you're a technical business, it's the technical de-risking of the actual opportunity, right? So if it's number one, typically the use of funds is basically how it's going to support market expansion or customer acquisition, how it's going to be helped with product development, right? So new features, innovation, enhancing it, rollouts, etc., or simply operational efficiency. Like if you're able to scale your growth, this will help you create X amount of margins. Like for me, for example, you know, my articulation for my capital is me scaling my capital HQ product, right? Effectively helps me achieve all those different elements as far as from scalability, efficiency in, in the business, you know, all those things that we've been investing in for the last few years, we can actually bring to realization, which is why, you know, if, when we crossed a milestone earlier this year, when we actually launched it, that was massive for us because it really started to paint a vision for what comes next. Top three growth drivers, right? How do your top, the and it, it may only be two for you, but I've seen people that come out with seven and you just, the brain just can't handle that much, right? So typically, what are your top three growth drivers that you're going to be focusing on to actually build the business, right? And how does the use of funds connect with those top three growth drivers? It sounds simple, right? But very few people actually do it. It's got to be so simple that when you look at it on the page, it's logical and it makes sense. This is the most important one for an investor to look at and say and ask themselves, do I agree with that thesis that this use of funds in this area will do this? I'll give you a perfect example. There's a family office that I deal with. 
they were big believers in the home services marketplace business. And he, what he did was he actually went around and he, he, he met with all the different home service operators and effectively asked them how they were thinking about growing their business, right? And the one he backed, they ended up backing with eight figures in the space of, I think it was two weeks, because he agreed with his thesis on how he was going to be growing it. And how he was going to be growing it was via engineers and product lines more so than by growing it with salespeople. And the reason is, is because for him, growing via software, via product-led model and an engineer-led model meant scalability, right, more so than having to hire 30 salespeople to grow the business, right? Super interesting. For the technical businesses, effectively, every technical business will have certain milestones that they'll have to cross, whether it be key data, data milestones or trial milestones. The way you need to articulate is how in crossing that specific trial or data milestone, that de-risks the opportunity, therefore creates additional value for the opportunity. And then how does that align with other references globally, you know, with your actual business, right? So when a lot of technical businesses don't understand, they just talk, keep on talking about raising capital. Well, you've really got to articulate the technical de-risking aspect as well. And for some of them, if they're in revenue, they've got to be able to articulate the de-risking as well as the, the revenue aspect as well, right? So... These things that I'm talking about will ultimately become your investment highlights, right? And also your communication points. So now you can start to see the formation of what would be a first conversation or what would be a high level conversation, you know, with a potential investor, right? So now onto the next fun part. So this is where I was meant to be halfway in. I'm at uh, 46 minutes. So look, just fragging, I may go five to 10 minutes over. Utilizing AI, I'm going to be super quick on this. So I'm a big believer in your custom instructions. So whether you're using ChatGPT, whether you're using Claude, or whether you're using um, Perplexity AI, you get the opportunity to put in custom instructions. Make sure you put in these elements, who you are and what you do, your mission, your product features, what is unique about, I've put in for me, what is unique about WI and Capital HQ, your track record, your traction, your product offering, et cetera, right? And then the outcomes you seek. To give you an idea, Right. Oh, sorry. And then on the next part, when you ask it, how do you want it to respond? Right. You want to put the tone of the answers. You want to ask it to provide additional suggestions. You also want it to align with the outcomes that you're going for as a business. Right. And by the way, when I tell you, I tell you the real stuff that I do, you're about to see exactly what I mean. Right. So and then the, your target persona of your business. Right. So who is your ideal customer? These are my real custom instructions. I actually had to take these out of um chat gbt and my other ones right these are my real custom instructions right so i've basically got in here who am i and what we do by the way i don't have with these headlines in there i just did that breakup for for you guys our mission our product features right what is unique about us our track record right our product offerings the outcome we seek and then when i talk about how i'd like it to respond this is my favorite one. Every time I do a prompt, I ask it to write four suggested prompts covering either relevant questions I should be asking or, idea or ideas to explore. Right, This way, it can provide me with four additional ideas that I may not have thought about that could add even more value to whatever the prompt it is that I'm using. By the way, if you're not using ChatGPT, the easiest way that I can say it to you is you are wasting your potential. ChatGPT puts your potential for what you can achieve as an individual person and X's it by five to 10 times, right? So if you're not using it, use it every day. Um, our alignment of my outcomes. So these are effectively what we're aiming to achieve as a business said. And I've, you know, if anyone's seen my presentations now, you know that this is, you know, effectively the focus for us as an actual business. It's created a target persona for me. I'm actually thinking about maybe I should try and update this to see if it's changed uh, with the different updates of the actual models, right? But it's actually got my target client in there. So all the text comes out in a very much in a certain way, right? And then it's got the industry that we're actually targeting, the funding stage, et cetera, right? Now, does that mean that every single person that I get will be exactly like that? But no, but it helps with the framework of everything that comes from it. Right, so these are my real custom instructions that I actually use. So I hope that's hope that was helpful. 
if you're creating a prompt, there is a structure to do it, and I'll be really quick with this. Effectively, and I said I will, I will actually send this around to everyone just to make it easier for you. I'll send it over the next couple of days. Uh, actually, actually, what I'll do is I'll send the video out so you can actually watch it, and I'll hyperlink in the presentation. But basically, this is how you actually structure a prompt, right? So you ask it, who's the persona you want it to be? You know, I want it to be, you know, the founder. You want it to be the greatest marketer you've ever met, right? You establish the persona. You basically are to let it know what you want it to do, the format of the out actual output, the goal of the prompt, the relevant data that it actually needs for that prompt, the tone of voice that you want from it, and then the audience targeting. If you notice, my tone is simple, professional, personable, and without hyperbole, right? The ultimate prompt, actually, I won't spend too much time on this because I am going to send it through, but effectively, there is a prompt which can actually help you create all the things that I've mentioned beforehand. It will not be perfect after the first go. How the smart people use ChatGPT is you get it to do what it does, and then you go and edit and refine it. So it does about sort of 70, 80%, sometimes 90%, and then you just go about editing it. But this is typically the structure. If you think about some of the most successful emails that go out in this space, this is what it looks like, right? Now, this is my old one where it's got AI-driven capital raising, but you get the idea, right? Very simple, very clean, right? And then what you're looking to achieve, right? All this is in there. All those things that I mentioned about the social proof aspects are covered in here, Right now, we've actually layered this across our business as well to streamline a lot of our internal processes. And in fact, we'll be building this into our software going forward so that when someone comes in, they basically need to just do three things and then we can create 80% of a deal room for them. Simple tips, provide as much relevant information as possible. After finishing the email, you basically, when, it, when you see the first email, you basically go and edit, you modify it. Then what you do is you put it back into ChatGPT and you ask it to rate it out of 10. I'm often having verbal, you know, verbal uh, you know, or having sort of sparring matches with ChatGPT to improve stuff. I am also crazy enough that I will use three different systems at one time. So I'll be trying stuff on ChatGPT. I'll be trying on Claude and I'll be trying it on Perplexity as well. I've even been exploring um, Grok and with the Meta um the open source version of what meta is doing right i basically want to get something to a nine out of ten and then i'm happy with it i don't agree with all of its suggestions but i typically take its feedback on board and it does a great when you ask it to rate out of ten it actually breaks down all the elements and you're like oh that's interesting right um and then effectively i try and keep everything i've got a capital raising gpt channel and i keep everything in that Right. So basically you upload all that information once, right? Information from your website, from your pitch deck. And that way it makes it easier for you to create content going forward. So the content you can create. So there's, you know, there's a there's a few people I can see that are actually on this session that you'll are uh, getting some of my inside secrets to how I'm actually so productive. One of the biggest feedbacks I get is, you know, people can't believe how much WI can can do you know effectively at one time and basically not be stressful about it but i tell you our entire team is literally utilizing different software and different tools in different ways right so all this sort of stuff you can actually create with this material it just absolutely streamlines everything right now i've also created a capital raising gpt so if you've got the paid version of chat gpt and you can get access to the, the different personal privatized GPTs. Just type in capital raising GPT by Capital HQ. Uh, and it says in there wholesale investor, you'll get access to my one. What I've done with that is I've uploaded all our all my training, all my videos that I've done, all my PowerPoints that I've done. I've uploaded that into it. So that basically people like the reason I did is I thought I want people to feel like they've got access to me and can ask me questions, you know, through ChatGPT as well as leverage off the benefits of ChatGPT with that. So I've done that. Um, and then rep simplifying repetitive tasks, you know, emails to potential investors, scheduling meetings, follow up emails. You know, basically my attitude is if you send something more than once, you systemize it. I use Apollo.io. I use it for note-taking for all calls, so I can basically use it for action items. 
Uh, it has these great things called snippets, templates, and sequences, right? So I don't have time to go into too much of it now, but effectively you can set up a whole bunch of different things to make it super easy for yourself. Then also I use Calendly. Anyone that's ever booked a meeting with me in, in the follow-up email to this, I'll utilize Calendly for it, right? I try, try and simplify things as much as possible. I even do little things like one of the things I was getting frustrated with was when I'd chat with people about my capital raise, they would start asking me questions, that, that like similar questions. So I created a short video so that before we have our discussion, they can watch that video and sort of un not ask me those questions, you know, which, you know, I would basically like things like what is unique about us? You know, how do, you know, how do we differ, all that sort of stuff. So, you know, that sort of stuff just ultimately ends up saving me time. All right. So next steps is I'm just going to talk for five minutes. Oh, actually, might I might actually finish on time. So I'm going to talk about. So now I'm going to talk about some of the ways in which you can actually engage with either wholesale investor and Capital HQ. You know, now if you're an investor, this could be for a portfolio company. You know, if you're an advisor, this could be for a, a client of yours, uh, or likewise, it could be for you personally. Everything we think about is how to simplify cap raising. Cap raising is will never be perfect because you're basically dealing with humans um, and that always makes it a bit challenging, but we're always trying to think of how to actually simplify it. So the next thing that we've got coming up is we're actually hosting our London Emergence Conference. So we've already got over 450 registered for it. it is the biggest thing that we actually do in London. It's the only major conference that we actually do. It's an incredible opportunity for anyone here, whether you're from Australia, Singapore, or the UK, to actually present your business at that event, right? So, you know, that's part of the, like, inside of our wholesale investor subscriptions, we have the ability where people can actually present at our uh, events in person. That's included in it. We're also shortly going to be launching our venture and capital uh, event for 2024, which I am pumped about. Uh, last year we had record turnout. This year I expect record turnout. You know, it said it's been crazy to see some of the numbers that are coming through for our events. And then I get into my little my my favorite sweet spot area of going all in on digital assets and our AI investment conference. To me, that will probably be. I wouldn't be surprised if that ends up being the biggest thing that we do this year. And the reason is because they are two of the hottest areas converging at one time, and there should be some incredible companies that actually come out of that. Um, the other thing where we haven't announced it publicly yet, um, but this is the first time I've actually mentioned it. I'm actually going to be doing a, a three-day uh, capital raising boot camp in Sydney. It's going to be in mid-August. It's going to be the one and only time that I ever do a boot camp. And the, the reason why we're doing it is because of all those different, basically, uh, the, the way I explain it to my team is I feel like I am freeing my soul by creating the content for this because everything that I've been frustrated about with this entire, with the ecosystem, with the capital raising process, with what founders are being taught from startup media, inside incubators, et cetera. I am going to let loose on, you know, what it's actually really like to try and explain it. And the best part is I know that there'll be investors that will come at this and you know they'll do it because they'll either be supporting their portfolio companies, et cetera. But I know that the most people in the ecosystem, basically there's a lot of things that happen in this ecosystem people just don't talk about. I'm going to let loose on that and go through everything step by step, provide all our templates, everything. You know, it's basically, as I said, it's one of, it feels like for me, it's one of the most freeing things that I've done in actually creation of this. Now, if you'd like to engage with us, basically, whether it be via a wholesale investor subscription or via a Capital HQ Plus uh, subscription for, for the 12 month opportunity, you so basically got two, two different offers, whether it be wholesale investor subscription or the Capital HQ Plus subscription. The difference between the two is Capital HQ Plus is just completely the online solution, access to our investors, ability to participate in an online showcase, et cetera. In the email that I'll send sort of following up from this, I'll bullet point, you know, what the sort of difference between the two is. The core wholesale investor subscription includes things like, you know, participating at our live and in per presenting at our in-person events, um, CEO interviews. It includes promotion to the wholesale investor database, et cetera. Basically, you'll receive a bonus invite to our Capital HQ Platinum networking event evening. 
So this is where, you know, in the at the end of June, we're going to be inviting a bunch of uh, fund managers, family officers and VCs for a private networking event. Uh, we've got 20 spots which we'll be allocating for subscribers that are coming on, whether it be, as I said, through wholesale investor subscriptions or to our Capital HQ Plus subscriptions for the 12 months. Um, basically, you'll, be, you'll receive an invite to that for one person in your team, and we've only got 20 spots available for that. And also, you get a bonus ticket, a uh, complimentary three-day ticket to my capital raising boot camp that I'll be doing. And my goal for that three days is I want it to absolutely change the way in which people think about capital raising forever and make a massive long-term difference. So, you know, that's some of the key things that we'll be, we'll be focusing on for that. So if you basically, if you want to reach out to me, please reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, likewise, you can email me. It's my real email that I use. Uh, I will reply. Likewise, I'll be sending a follow-up email to this probably in the next sort of half an hour or so. Um, and I'll just outline, obviously, you know, I'm great, obviously be very thankful for everyone to, to come along and just let you know about how you can participate in some of the upcoming activities that we're doing. But mostly, as I said, typically with all this sort of stuff, I spend 95% of my time giving value in it. And then at the end, I do talk about what we do. So I hope you got value uh, from the session. And also, if you can, because basically, when I've, I've been doing workshops for years and people always say nice things to me. If you can and you feel like it, please leave a, leave a little bit of a, a testimonial or something. say something positive to me in an email that we can potentially use in marketing. I said, I am going to be spending a lot more time over the next year focused on this education aspect of accessing engaging investors, um, the capital raising process and also capital raising strategy. And, you know, and I want to make sure that as many people value, get value from that as possible. So that is it for me. Feel free to ask any, if you want to ask any questions. I'm finishing the, my presentation there, but I'm going to stay around if anyone wants to ask any questions. So feel free to, to fire away. Thanks, Rod. Appreciate that. Thanks, Kairos. Uh, Brenda, yes, as mentioned, I will be sending through the slides to sort of post this. Thanks, Andrew. No, everyone's shy today. No, I must have really well articulated well for, for there to be no questions. So it's a, it's a challenging topic taking on what the whole ecosystem says is the most important document and then actually showing what really is most important before you even get to that. Uh, someone's asked, will we provide any business valuation service? No, that's not us. Uh, we're effectively not, you know, it's typically it's the one area I don't touch. I do give feedback about what to do about, you know, how to think about it. And there's plenty of resources online that you can look at from valuations. Um, startups generally don't have a revenue history. That's it. That's our problem. Phil, in the history of working with startups and scale ups, there's a lot more issues than not having revenue. There's plenty of companies every single year that raise capital without a revenue, without revenue. And there's ways in which there's ways in which to do that. And all those things that I mentioned before, right? There's other aspects to talk to about doing it. If you go and have a look online, you'll see that like throughout history of startups, plenty of people have been funded without having revenue. So that's not your problem. The way whatever you what whatever you're talking about, however you're communicating what you're doing, may be more of the issue than just not having revenue. All right, ladies and gentlemen, and Andrew. Just joking. All right. Hope you have 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 a great night. Said I'll send an email to you all shortly, and uh, look forward to to speaking with you all soon.